We've been looking at properties of polynomials, um, shapes of what polynomials may look like depending on the degree. We talked about zeros of polynomials, knowing if we're gonna cross or touch the x-axis depending on the multiplicity of a factor. We're gonna be getting into more of finding zeros of a polynomial. So in your mathematical educational career, you probably have only looked at finding zeros where um, a graph is crossing an x-axis by looking at quadratic equations or linear equations. Maybe it was a higher degree, but it was, it was factorable. So we're going to be given tools now to find zeros of a polynomial if it's not factorable. And so there's a lot of different theorems that are going to help us to do this. Let me just go through the objectives of this um, lecture, and then we'll get going with the material. So objectives, there's what is called a remainder theorem. And that remainder theorem is going to help us find these zeros. This is probably the most um, useful theorems in helping us find zeros of a polynomial. And within that remainder theorem, we're using what is called the factor theorems. And we'll go more in detail on that as we go through this lecture. There's another um, property or rule that is going to help us find zeros. And that is Descartes' rule of signs. And Descartes' rule of signs, this helps us determine how many positive zeros we have or possible positive zeros we have and the number of possible negative zeros we have of a, of a function. So if we know that there can only be one positive zero and we find one, and then we're not gonna continue looking for positive ones. And so this kind of helps us narrow down our search. We're gonna use the rational zero theorem um, to possibly list the potential rational zeros of a polynomial. And when I just stated above the remainder theorem, I was thinking the rational zero theorem. Um, so the rational zeroes theorem is that's the one that actually is the one that we're going to be using a lot that's going to help us the most. Um, find the real zeros of a polynomial function. That's our whole main goal of this section and to be able to rewrite things as factors. Um, we're going to be able to solve polynomial equations. Um, there are is a theorem that can tell us upper bounds and lower bounds of our zeros. And so again, that's going to narrow down our list so we don't have to maybe check as many values before we find the zero. And then there's a really um, important theorem that you'll see again when you take calculus, and that's the intermediate value theorem. So in this section, I'm going to be referring to terminology that is is meaning the same thing. So if it's asking you to find a zero of a polynomial, or they're asking you to find a root of a polynomial, or an x-intercept or x-intercepts of a polynomial, we're looking for the exact same thing. So before we get into all these theorems, it's important that you know how to do long division. And so I think before we look at long divisions of a polynomial, which you should know how to do, and if you don't, then you can go back and do a little more um, studying up on this. Um, but before we look at it with polynomials long division, let's look at just doing long division with numbers. And because that's the same process that we're gonna be doing when we're doing long division with polynomials. And so let's just come up with some example. So for instance, let's say that it says we have 174 and we're dividing this by 12. So as we go through this, we're gonna talk about terminology also. So the number that we're dividing into is called the dividend.
the number we're dividing by is called the divisor. So we're gonna set up our long division. So we're looking at 12 and we're dividing that into 174. So as you're going through this, you're looking at your divisor and you're looking at the first term of our dividend and you're thinking to yourself, 12 goes into one how many times? Well, it doesn't. And so we look at combining that number with the next one. So 12 goes into 17 how many times? And so 12 goes into 17 one time. So once you figure out that number or um, term that it goes in there, then you're gonna take that and you're gonna multiply it to your divisor. And so we're gonna look at one times 12, which is 12. And we're gonna put it below. So recall, once you find that number, you're looking at subtracting this off. And so we're looking at 17 minus 12, which gives us five. We're gonna bring down our next number in that divisor, which is a four. And so now we're thinking to ourselves, 12 goes into 54 about how many times? And 12, I would say goes into 54, probably about four times. And if you choose wrong, you'll know once you've distributed, but we are looking at this four goes four times two is eight. So I'm going to put that below my four and four times one is four. And then recall, we're going to look at this and we're going to subtract it off. And so I would borrow and I would get 14 minus eight, which is six. I noticed that that number is smaller than my divisor. And if it's smaller, then we chose right. If it's bigger, then we needed to choose a bigger number. Um, there's no other numbers to bring down. And so what we're left with is the remainder. So we could rewrite this um, as a decimal and continue going, but we're not gonna be doing that. So that is our remainder, what's left. What's up here, what we found multiplied to 12 to get us close to the dividend, 174. This is called our quotient. And so we can rewrite our problem, 174 divided by 12. And another way to write that is in the denominator is equal to our quotient 14 plus our remainder six divided by our divisor of 12. So we'll go back in a second to look at long division, but let me bring up um, the division algorithm. And so we have the division algorithm right in front of us. So if f of x and g of x are denoted polynomials functions and g of x is a polynomial whose degree is greater than zero, so it means it's just, it's not a constant, has a variable in there. And then there's a unique polynomial function. We are gonna call it Q of X and R of X such that if we take F of X divided by G of X, this is equal to Q of X all over R of X, um, sorry, plus R of X over G of X. Or we can say F of X is equal to Q of X times G of X plus R of X where our rex is either the zero polynomial or a polynomial of degree less than g of x. So let's go back up really quickly to that long division we did of numbers and let's rewrite it in the other form. And so when we divided here 174 by 12, 
um, we said 174 divided by 12 was equal to 14 plus 6 over 12. And normally I would reduce that to one half. But um, let's not do that. I'm not worried about that right now. But notice if we clear our fraction. If we multiply both sides of our equation by 12, we can do this because this is an equation. We 12s cancel on the left-hand side. And you're left with 174, which is our dividend, is equal to 14 times 12, our quotient times our divisor, plus, so when we distribute this 12 to 6 over 12, the 12s are going to cancel, leaving us with 6. And so we can check this. We can look at, I'd have to do this over here or I'll get into the calculator. But if I had a calculator, I probably wouldn't be doing long division anyways. But anyways, two times four is eight. Two times one is two. I bring down my zero placeholder. One times four is four. One times one is one. If we add these together, we get 168. And so we get 174. This is equal to 168 plus six, which 174 is equal to 174. So this was also a good check. Okay. So there is a couple different ways that we could have written this. Let me just get rid of all my markings in here. So that long division, we could have lit, written it like this, 174 over 12 equals 14 plus the remainder six over our divisor. Or we could have written it as 174 is the same thing as 14 times 12 plus six. So when we're gonna be looking for our zeros, our whole main goal is to have our remainder to be zero. And we're trying to find those values that go evenly into our dividend. Okay, so now let's look at um, long division with a polynomial. So we wanna look at how about 3x cubed plus 4x squared plus x plus 7. And we're dividing this by x squared plus 1. Let me put parentheses around. OK, so let's rewrite this. So we have our divisor, we're gonna put it out here, x squared plus one. We're dividing into our dividend, three x cubed plus four x squared plus x plus seven. And so we're looking at, we're gonna look at our first term of our divisor and you're thinking to yourself, what can I multiply x squared by to get this first term and our dividend, 3x cubed? Well, I know 3 times 1 is 3, so I know that my coefficient is going to be 3. And I know x times x squared is x cubed, so 3x cubed. Sorry, not 3x cubed, 3x squared. is going to be what we're going to use. And so we're going to take that number that we chose and we're going to distribute it to each term in our divisor and we're going to place it under our dividend. So we have 3x squared. Why did I say 3x squared? It should just be 3x. We have 3x times x squared, which is 3x cubed. And then we have 3x times 1, 
this gives me plus three X. And I'm gonna put that plus three X because of like terms, I'm gonna put it over here, plus three X. So we're gonna take this and we're gonna subtract this thing off. And so that negative is being distributed to each term that we just brought down. So we really have three X cubed minus three X cubed, which cancels. That was the whole purpose of choosing three X. There's nothing we're subtracting off here. So this is like minus zero X squared. So four X squared minus zero X squared, I'm gonna bring down my four X squared. That negative, remember, is being distributive. So I have really X minus three X, and that's gonna give me a minus two X. So I am going to now look again and I'm looking at the first term and my dividend and divisor x squared. And I'm thinking to myself, x squared times what gives me back four x squared? Well, x squared plus four, x squared times four gives me four x squared. So let's distribute that four. And so we have four times x squared gives us four x squared. Four times one gives me plus four. I'm gonna put it over here. So we really have a plus zero x here. Now let's bring down our seven also. And then we are subtracting this whole thing off. So that negative is being distributed and we have four x squared minus four x squared cancels. We have negative two x plus or minus zero x is negative two x. And we have seven minus four, which gives us positive three. So notice that what we have left down here, that degree is less than our divisor. And so we're done. And we have a remainder. That's negative two X plus three. And so we could write what we have here. This is equal to our quotient three X plus four plus our remainder, which was negative two X plus three, all divided by our divisor X squared plus one. Okay, so that is a little bit of a review of dividing by um, polynomial functions using long division. But we're gonna be trying to find these zeros. And so when we're trying to find these zeros, a lot of times we're dividing by linear functions. And if they're dividing by a linear function, we can use a different method to do the division, which is called synthetic division. So let me go through doing long division with a linear function and side by side, let's do that or um, do it with synthetic division. So looking at this, this is steps of polynomials, a synthetic division method. So the following are steps required for synthetic division of a polynomial. We can't always use synthetic division. Step one, you're gonna set up the problem. We need to set the denominator equal to zero. And we wanna find the number um, to put in what we call the division box. And then um, the numerator is written in descending order. Uh, and if there's any missing terms, like we had a missing term above, um, Actually, we didn't, it was in our divisor. If there's any missing terms, then we're gonna need to put a zero to fill in that spot. And at last, list all the coefficients in the division problem. So maybe while we're reading this off, let's do one. And so let's say we have the following problem. So let's say that we had f of x, we're given that f of x is equal to negative four x cubed 
plus 5x squared plus 8. And we're going to divide this by x plus 3. Okay, so long division, what we're dividing by has to be in this form where our coefficient in front of our variable is one and it's plus or minus some constant c. And so the first step I said was look at your divisor, x plus three in our case, set that equal to zero and solve for your variable. And that's the number that we're gonna be putting up here in this box, division box. I kind of don't make a box, I kind of just make a backwards capital L. That's one way to describe it, I guess. Um, so we would find that number, put that up there in our division box. And now we're gonna write out the coefficients of our dividend. So we have here a negative four and we're doing descending order of powers. So X cubed, X squared, X, and then the constant. We're gonna put the coefficient, next coefficient five. Notice there is no X term. So we're gonna place a placeholder zero and then we're putting the constant eight. I'm going to put a line below, but enough to put number below the numbers that we just did. And as we're doing this, well, let me just read through the next step. So now when the problem is set up perfectly, we're going to bring down the first number or the leading coefficient straight down. So we're going to bring down our number negative four straight down, our first number. Then step three, put the result in the next column by multiplying that number in the division box with a number that you just brought down. So we're gonna look at negative three times negative four, which is 12. And we're going to put that number below the next coefficient, which is five. So once you've done that, write, um, write the result of the problem um, of the row by adding the two numbers together. Okay, so we're gonna add five plus 12, and we're gonna put that number below, which is 17, and we're gonna repeat this process. And so we're gonna take the number in our division box, negative three, we're gonna multiply it by 17 and put it underneath the next number. So negative three times 17, that is a negative 51. We're gonna sum this. So zero minus 51 is negative 51. We're gonna multiply our number in our division box, negative three times negative 51. And that would give me 153. Put it below the next number and sum this. And so this would give me 161. So you're gonna repeat the process until we get to the end, and then we can write out our final answer. So it's telling me that the numbers in the bottom of the row with the last number is being the remainder. Um, the numbers in the bottom of the row with the last number being the remainder, and the remainder which is written as a fraction for the final answer. Okay, so we're, what we're doing is we're looking at what degree this is, which is a cubic. So this is gonna be one degree less and the coefficient of the one degree less. And so I could rewrite this as negative four X squared plus 17 X minus 51 and then plus our remainder, 161, all over our divisor, which in this case was x plus three. So let's look at that. So this, this right here, what we just did was f of x divided by, 
don't, we don't have room to write all of f of x out, divided by x plus 3 is equal to this. So let's do the same thing now, and let's just show it with long division. And you're going to get so good at synthetic division by us using it so much in this section. Um, but let's just show it with long division, showing that you're getting the same thing. And so long division, right, we would have put the x plus 3 out here. This is going into negative 4x cubed plus 5x squared. I'm going to put a placeholder plus 0x plus 8. So we're looking at the first number x. x times what would give us back negative 4x cubed? Well, x times negative 4x squared would give us back negative 4x cubed. And so we're going to distribute and put this below. And so we would get x times negative 4x squared is negative 4x cubed. Negative 4x squared times 3, that is a negative 12x squared. We're going to subtract this whole thing off. And so that changes the sign to what we just put down there. So really, it's negative 4x cubed plus 4x cubed. Those cancel. Whole point of choosing what we did. And then we have a 5x squared minus a negative 12x squared. So 5x squared plus 12x squared gives me 17x squared. Let's bring down our next term. So plus 0x. And we're going to repeat the process, thinking to ourselves x times what gives us back 17x squared? Well, x times 17x gives us back 17x squared. So distributing that again, we have 17x times x is 17x squared. 17x times 3 gives me plus 51x. And now we're going to subtract off this whole thing. 17x squared minus 17x squared, that cancels. We have a 0 minus 51x gives me negative 51x. Bringing down our next term, plus 8. And repeat the process. x times what gives me back negative 51x is minus 51. We're going to distribute that negative 51. So negative 51 times x is negative 51x. Negative 51 times positive 3, that was negative 153. Subtract that off. And so what 50, negative 51x plus 51x cancels. And then this is 8, really, plus 153, which is 161. So notice that our quotient that we got is the same thing as the bottom row. The coefficients are the same. And then our remainder, 161, is what we got over here, the last a number in that horizontal. And so the long division is just so much easier process of seeing if something goes evenly into the function. Okay, but again, you can only use synthetic division if it's in that form of x plus c. Okay, so let's look at our first um, theorem in this section, which is called the remainder theorem. So the remainder theorem is really going to be helpful because we want a remainder of zero to find factors. And so this remainder theorem says, suppose f is a polynomial function. If f of x is divided by x minus c, then the remainder is f of c. So basically what that's saying is I can go in wherever I see an X, I can plug in C and 
do my um, order of operations. And when I get back, when I plug in C for X, it's going to be the remainder as if I had divided X minus C into that polynomial. So let's look at an example of that. So looking at an example, let's look at how about f of x is equal to 4x to the fourth minus 15x squared minus 4. And we're dividing by x minus 2. So the direction state, use the remainder theorem to find the remainder when f of x is divided by x minus c. Then use the factor theorem to determine whether x minus c is a factor. Okay, we haven't talked about the factor theorem, so maybe I should just scroll down and give you that factor theorem really quickly. And what that factor theorem says that suppose f is a polynomial function, then we could say x minus c is a factor of f of x if and only if when we look at f of c, this is equal to zero. So we get a remainder of zero. So the factor theorem actually consists of two separate statements. It's telling us if f of c equals zero, then x minus c is a factor of f of x. And it's saying if x minus c is a factor of f of x, then f of c must equal zero. Okay, so we're gonna use that once we see that this is a factor. So by this theorem, our C value, it's opposite sign, or just think of it as if I was solving for zero, that would be in this case, X minus two is zero when X is two. And so what this theorem says is, we're gonna look at F of two. If we get this back as zero, then we know that X minus two is a factor. And so we're gonna go in here and we're gonna plug in two wherever we see an X and simplify. So go ahead and go in and write parentheses wherever you see an X. So we have four parentheses raised to the fourth minus 15 parentheses raised to the second minus four. Now drop in two inside your parentheses and then order of operations, exponents become before multiplication. And so I have four times two to the fourth. Well, two to the fourth is 16. So four times 16 minus 15 times two squared, two squared gives us back four minus four. So multiplication comes before any addition or subtraction. So four times 16, that would give us 64 minus 15 times four, that is 60 minus four. So this gives us zero. So this is saying my remainder is zero. So x minus two is a factor. Of f of x. So instead of actually going in and plugging in two wherever we see an x, we could have done long division. And so let's do that. And technically, a lot of times the long division, or not long division, synthetic division is going to be faster than what we just did. If we were in the, a classroom, I might have half the class do the long or synthetic division and half the class go in and plug in the value we're looking at wherever they saw an X. And the students that were doing the long di um, synthetic division can usually do it a lot faster, just, just as a side note. But anyways, we're looking at two and we're going to write down in the horizontal, the coefficients in front of our variables in descending order of powers, putting in a zero if we're missing a variable power. So I have four for my x to the fourth power. Um, I don't have an x cubed, so I'm going to put a placeholder zero. Then I have negative 15 in front of my x squared. I don't have an x term, so I'm putting in a placeholder of zero. And then negative four. So long division or synthetic division, 
I don't know why I keep saying long division. Um, bring down the first number four, and then we're gonna multiply that by the number in our division box. So two times four is eight. Sum these two numbers, zero plus eight is eight. Two times eight is 16. Sum these numbers is one. Two times one is two. Zero plus two is two. Two times two is four. Negative four plus four is zero. So I know that this last number is my remainder. I have a remainder of zero. Also, when I do it this way, I also know x minus two times what gives me our f of x function. Well, recall these are coefficients of our quotient, one degree less than what we started with. We started with a cube. I'm sorry, we started with a fourth power. So we're looking at the first term being a cube. So that would be four x cubed plus eight x squared plus x plus two. And this is what f of x would equal to. So we used the remainder theorem and we saw that our factor was um, a factor or our, our divisor was a factor because our remainder was zero. And so we could rewrite our function f of x as a product of that divisor times our quotient. So maybe let's look at one more looking at that, and then we'll look at some more rules of finding zeros of polynomials. And so let's say that f of x is the following. So 2x to the sixth uh, minus 18x to the fourth plus x squared minus nine, and we're looking at x plus three, dividing into that. So we wanna know, is x plus three a factor of f of x? And if so, we wanna rewrite that as a product of factors. So I would probably, again, I would look at my, instead of plugging in negative three, wherever I saw an x, I would use my synthetic division I know that my C value, x plus three is equal to zero when x is equal to negative three. So negative three is the number I'm putting up here in my division box. We're gonna write a horizontal line of just the coefficients in front of our variables, putting in a place over zero for any terms missing. So x to the six, so we have two. We don't have an x to the fifth power, so zero. Negative 18 for the x to the fourth. There's no x cubed term, so put zero. x squared, the coefficient is one. There's no x term, put zero. And then minus nine or negative nine. So bring our first number down two. multiply that by the number in our division box, we get negative six. Sum that column, zero plus negative six is negative six. Repeat the process, negative three times negative six is 18. Sum negative 18 plus 18, we get zero. Negative three times zero is zero. Zero plus zero is zero. Negative three times zero is zero. One plus zero though is one. Negative three times one is negative three. Zero plus negative three is negative three. Negative three times negative three is nine. I get a remainder here of zero. And this is what we're gonna get so happy when we see that zero there. Um, so, we have a remainder of zero. And so we can say that x plus three is a factor of f of x. And we can rewrite out f of x, f of x, we could get back 2x to the 6 minus 18x to the 4th plus x squared minus 9 if we multiplied 
our divisor, x minus x plus 3 divisor, all times our quotient. So our quotient, we're starting one degree less. One degree less than 6 is 5. And so this is going to be the coefficient to the x to the fifth term. So this would be 2x to the fifth minus 6x to the fourth. I'm not going to write plus 0x cubed to plus 0x squared. I'm just going to leave those out. Plus the next term would be x minus 3. So x plus 3 is a factor because our remainder is 0. And we can say because of the remainder theorem and the factor theorem, that holds true. So our next theorem that we're going to use to help to rewrite these polynomials is the following. Every polynomial functions with real coefficients can be uniquely factored into a product of linear and or irreducible quadratic factors. So these irreducible quadratic factors, these are quadratic equations that if we um, factored it, or if we use the quadratic formula, if we found the zeros, they would be imaginary numbers, complex numbers. So these quadratic factors have imaginary numbers. as zeros. Okay, and so if they have imaginary numbers as the zeros, then we're going to keep it as a quadratic. So in the past, when we were solving quadratics, we're solving equations that weren't linear. We got everything to one side of the equation. A lot of times we tried to factor it. Um, and so if we could factor it, then we would set each factor equal to zero and solve. And we're doing this by what is called the zero product property. It says if A times B is equal to zero, then A equals zero or B equals zero. So the factor theorem tells us that finding the zeros of a polynomial is really the same as factoring it into linear factors. So here is the main theorem that we're going to be looking at and using to help us find those zeros of a polynomial. And so what the rational zero theorem says is if you have a polynomial, P of x, so remember, we could rewrite polynomials in the form of a sub n x raised to the nth power plus a sub n minus 1 plus x raised to the n minus 1 power plus dot, 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 plus a sub 2 x squared plus a sub 1 times x plus a sub 0. Um, so if that polynomial has integer coefficients, it has to have integer coefficients to be able to use this theorem. Then rational zeros of P, our P of X function, are going to be in the form of lowercase p over lowercase q. So rational zeros of our polynomial function is P divided by Q, where P is a factor of A sub 0, our constant. So the factors of the constant. all over Q, and Q is factors of A sub N. So factors of our leading coefficient.
So in the example below, it says list all possible rational zeros given by the rational zero theorem. Okay, so we're going to look at factors. So numbers that go evenly into our constant, and our constant in this case is 12. So usually I start out by looking at those factors. They can be either positive or negative. So I'm going to put plus or minus in front. Well, one is always a factor of a number and itself is always a factor of a number, but I'm going to go up in ascending order. So one goes into 12. I would see if two does, it does. Two goes into 12. I know three goes into 12 evenly. Four goes into 12 evenly. Five does not. Six does, and the next number that goes into 12 is itself 12. So plus or minus those numbers I just listed are factors of 12. And now we're gonna look at factors of our leading coefficient, which in this case is six. So numbers that go evenly into six, well, plus or minus, and then one goes into six evenly, two goes into six evenly, three goes into six evenly, four does not, five does not, and six goes into six evenly. So this rational zero set theorem says, if it has a zero, it has to be in the form of this P divided by Q. And that's if it has a, um, yeah, a rational zero. So this right here is a key, rational zero. So it has to, if it has a rational zero, it's in this form. So this does not include irrational zeros. So like the square root of two is irrational. And so this theorem is not gonna help us find those and it does not include the complex zeros. Well, complex numbers could be real numbers. So I'm just gonna say it does not include imaginary numbers. Okay, so possible rational zeros are gonna be P divided by Q. So I'm gonna start listing this off. So what I tend to do is I look at the first number for my P value up here, and I divide it by each number below, and I would list that down. So one divided by one, which is one. I have one divided by two, which is one half. I have one divided by three, which is one third. And I have one divided by six, which is one six. Then I would move to the next number, factor of P. So next number would be two. And I would go through and I would take two and divide it by each number for Q. If it was a number that I already had listed, I would not write it twice. So I'd have two divided by one, which is two. 2 divided by 2, which is 1. So I already have 1 listed. I wouldn't write that again. I'd have 2 divided by 3, which is 2 thirds. I would have 2 divided by 6, which reduces down to 1 third. It's already listed. I wouldn't list it again. So move to the next number in our list for P. So that would be 3. So I'm looking at three divided by one, which is three. Three divided by two, which is three halves. Three divided by three, which is one, already listed. And three divided by six, which is one half, already listed. Move into the next number, four. So four divided by one is four. Four divided by two is two, already listed. 
four divided by three is four thirds. And four divided by six reduces down to two thirds and it's already listed. So move down to the next number, six. Six divided by one is six. Six divided by two is three, we already have it. Six divided by three is two, already have it. And six divided by six is one, already have that number. Move down to the next. So 12, 12 divided by one is 12. Don't have that one. 12 divided by two is six, already have it. 12 divided by three is four, already have that number listed. And 12 divided by six is two, and I already have that listed. So if our polynomial six x to the fourth minus one x squared plus two x plus 12 has a rational zero, it would be, it would have to be a, one of these numbers or it would have to be these. And so we just took an infinite number of possibilities and narrowed it down to a finite possibility. And so now, once we find those rational zeros, what we're gonna be doing, because we're trying to find factors or zeros of that polynomial, we're gonna start then now checking um, using synthetic division and hoping that we get a zero as a remainder. And if it does, then we find a factor. So in front of you are the guidelines for finding zeros of a polynomial P of X. So first thing you, you are gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna list all your possible rational zeros. So you're looking at that P divided by Q, where P again are factors of your constant and Q are factors of the leading term. So once you've listed all of your possible rational zeros, you're going to use synthetic division to evaluate P of X at each possible rational zero. When the remainder is zero, note the quotient you have obtained and move to step three. So we're gonna repeat um, step one and step two on the quotient. So we're not gonna use the original, we're gonna look at the quotient. And then we're gonna stop when we reach the quotient that is either quadratic and easily factorable or that we have um, find the remaining zeros of the quotient. Okay, so let's look at some examples of finding zeros of a polynomial. So we have an example in front of it us, it says factor the polynomial P of X, which is equal to two X cubed plus X squared minus 13 X plus six. So first thing we wanna do is find all of our possible rational zeros. And so we're gonna list out factors of our constant six. So numbers that go into six evenly are plus or minus one, two, three, and six. So those are all numbers that divide into six evenly. Now we're looking at factors of our leading coefficient, which is two, and factors of two are just one and two plus or minus. So now we're gonna look at P divided by Q and all those different possibilities. So one divided by one, which gives us back one. One divided by two gives us back one half, moving to two. Two divided by one is two and two divided by two is one. So I don't need to look at that one. Th going to three. Three divided by one is three, and then three divided by two. Going to my next number, six. Six divided by one is six, and six divided by two is three. <clears throat> but we already have that one listed, so I'm not gonna relist it. 
So these are all the possible zeros, rational zeros of that polynomial P of X. And so now we want to check for our zeros and we're going to use synthetic division to do that. So maybe let's just start with one. We're going to list the coefficients of our polynomial P of X in descending order of powers, putting in a place holder if needed. So we have an X cubed, so two. X squared would be one, negative 13 X, so negative 13, and our constant six. So bringing down our first number two, one times two is two, one plus two is three, one times three is three, negative 13 plus three is negative 10, one times negative 10 is negative 10, and six plus negative 10 is not zero, so I know that one is not a factor, or x minus one is not a factor. I know one is not a zero. And so I would go through and I would do this again. I don't tend to like to deal with fractions if possible, so I would skip my fractions and I'd probably jump to two. So rewriting the coefficients of our polynomial. So two, one, negative 13, and six. And I would start the process over, bringing down the first number two. So two times two is four. One plus four is five. Two times five is 10. Negative 13 plus 10 is negative three. Two times negative three is negative six. And I'm really happy because I get a remainder of zero. So I know X equals two is a zero. of p of x. So that means that x minus 2 is a factor of p of x by that factor theorem. So right now, we have our polynomial p of x. This is equal to our factor we just found, x minus two times, so recall this is our quotient. We're starting one degree less than P of x, in this case, so we had a cubed, so this would be x squared. So we have two x squared plus five x minus three. And so I can continue and use this rational zero theorem. I could actually limit down how many zeros, possible rational zeros there are, but this is quadratic. So I should be either able to factor it or I could go and use the quadratic formula. Um, but looking at it, it looks kind of factorable to me. I think it's factorable. And if we want to do a side over here, so two X squared plus five X minus three, Fortunately, our coefficient in front of the x squared is not one. So we would look at two times negative three is negative six. What multiplies to negative six and would add to a positive five. And that would be six and negative one. So make sure that you rewrite your middle term using those two numbers. And then we're gonna factor by grouping as the trick. And so we have two x squared plus six x minus x minus three. So factoring from two x squared plus six x, we could pull out a two x from both of those terms. If we did so, we would be left with x plus three. And then looking at the last two terms, I want the same thing to be in the parentheses. And so I notice if I pull out a negative one, I would be left with positive x plus three. So now I can pull out what they have inside the parentheses, x plus three from both of those groupings. And I'd be left with two x minus one. So we just factored this quadratic. And so we can rewrite p of x as x minus two, all times x plus three, all times 2x minus 1. 
So this is factored completely, which was our next step, step three. And I wanted to find all the zeros. So our zeros of P of X, well, we found that two was a zero. If you looked at when is x plus 3 equal to 0, that's when x is negative 3. And then look at when 2x minus 1 is equal to 0. If I add 1 divided by 2, I get back 1 half. So graphically, notice that those factors occur only once, so multiplicity is odd. And so we know graphically that those are places where our graph is going to cross the x-axis at x equals 2, x equals negative 3, and 1 half. And I want you to notice those are all rational numbers. And those are all numbers that were listed in our possible rational um, zeros by using the rational zero theorem. I think that's pretty darn cool. So looking at another example, it says factor the polynomial P of X equals 2X cubed minus 3X squared minus 2X plus 3. And so I would look at my possible rational zeros first. So looking first at my values that go into three evenly, it's plus or minus one and three. And then numbers that go into my leading coefficient of two evenly are plus or minus one and two. So if I look at P divided by Q, and list all the factors just once, I'd have one divided by one is one, one divided by two is one half, go to the next number, three divided by one is three, and three divided by two is three halves. So if this has a zero, it's gonna be one of those, a rational zero, it's gonna be one of those. And so now I would start testing. And so let's first look at one. So writing our coefficients of our polynomial P of X down, we have two, negative three, negative two, and three. Bring down our first number two. So one times two is two. Negative three plus two is negative one. One times negative one is negative one. Negative two minus one is negative three. Negative three times one is negative three and three minus three is zero. So we found x equals one is a zero. And so that means that x minus one, subtract one on each side, is a factor. So, so far we have our polynomial P of X is equal to our factor we just found, X minus one times, so one degree less than what we started with for P of X. So that's gonna be a square. So we'll have two X squared minus X minus three. If 2x squared minus x minus 3 was irreducible quadratic, I'd leave it like that, but I don't know that unless I find the zeros. So I would either try to factor that or I would plug that into the quadratic formula. Or you can do what you're just doing right now and repeat the process. I notice that it's factorable. I'm going to do trial and error this time. So two numbers that multiply to 2x squared, we're going to need a 2x and we're going to need an x. 
I need two numbers that are gonna multiply to give me um, negative three, which is negative three and positive one. I believe I'm gonna put a negative three with a two X. So two X minus three and plus one. I just need to make sure my middle term is correct. So two X times one is two X and negative three times X is negative three X. Negative three X plus two X is negative X, which is our middle term. So we chose the correct factors. And so we factored this completely as a product of unique rational, um, unique linear factors. And our zeros, looking at this, are x equals 1. So 2x minus 3, this is equal to 0. If we add 3, divide by 2, so at 3 halves. And then x plus 1 is equal to 0 when x is negative 1. Again, those are all numbers that were listed up here and are possible rational zeros. So we found the zeros of our polynomial, and we found um, the unique product of
Okay. <laughs> so um, for those of you that are still there, it took me this long to get in on my cell phone. Um, we, I, I, um, the electricity went out. So that's what happened. And that's why I got dropped from the, the meeting. So once I'm gone down to campus and taught my class, I'll come back up at student hours from four to five if you want to come in and see me. But I will finish um, the lecture up either this evening or tomorrow is a professional development day for faculty. So I can always jump on and finish the lecture then. But apologize for any any inconvenience, but I didn't realize that was going to happen, obviously. Um, so I don't know if there's any questions you guys have. I don't have um, access. I guess I do have access to chat, but it'd be better if you just unmuted yourself and talked to me if you have any questions. If not, you're free to go, and I will message or I'll push, put an announcement out once I've finished recording that the rest of the lecture. If anyone wants, I can let them know what time, and you can always jump in and, and listen while I, I finish it. And if I do that, I guess I could always just put in the announcement, you know, I'm getting on at this time to finish the lecture. If you want to come in, you can. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Take care. <laughs> yeah, so if not, um, I'll see you guys on Thursday. Stop the recording if possible. is recording this whole thing. <laughs> Anyways, um, so if you have any questions, just email me, and I'm going to log off now. <laughs>